Okay, so this has been going on for a few months now, but things just went to the next level last night. I was about six months pregnant when this started, back in October. We had only been living in this house for about two or three months and everything had been normal. The first few times it happened, I didn't think too much about it. I just thought it was a bird or something. The whistling always happens at night. It is one higher pitched whistle, a very short pause, and then a lower pitched whistle. I'll start with the first time I noticed there was something odd. I was probably seven months pregnant and my dog and I were napping on the couch. For whatever reason while I was pregnant, I would moan in my sleep. Sometimes, so loud I would wake myself up. So, I was asleep and I woke myself up moaning and then I heard the whistling, but it sounded like it was coming from the kitchen. I know I was just hearing things because the dog shot up and looked in the kitchen and his ears perked up. After that happened, I noticed that the whistling was only happening at night and I had never heard a bird or anything else make a sound during the day. It started to become more frequent, but the dog and I were the only ones that were hearing it. I told my husband about it, but he just kind of brushed it off. The second weird thing that happened was, at the end of my pregnancy, my husband and I were in bed. I was sleeping and he was watching TV. I was moaning like normal. My husband said it was getting louder and louder. Then he heard the whistling and I stopped moaning. He woke me up to tell me this. After I had my daughter in January, the whistling had pretty much stopped until the last couple of weeks. I had been hearing it almost every night on Sunday. My husband and I both heard it. Last night, after my husband got home from work, he took the dog outside. We have a very long and narrow patch of trees directly across the road from our house. I was in the house. The windows were open but the curtains were closed so I could hear but not see. So, according to my husband, the dog was peeing and really focused on a patch of trees. And then he saw a cat, but the cat was stalking something in the trees. After the dog was done peeing, he took off. At first, my husband thought it was the cat was something shot out of the trees. In the house, I heard claws on the pavement. First, really fast ones, then obvious strides of our dog. I heard my husband yell for the dog to come back. When they came in the house, it looked as if my husband had seen a ghost. He said that whatever came out of the trees was pretty big. About as big as our dog, who was a Doberman pincher about 110 pounds on all fours. It ran so fast that he said that he wasn't paying attention and probably would have missed it if he wasn't looking. It looked more like a human though that was on all fours. It was dark in color and jumped in the air and disappeared. All last night the dog did not want to be alone. Usually he sleeps on the couch but my husband had to throw him out on the bed. This morning my husband went outside to the trees to see if there was any obvious spot where this thing was been living. He went over to check it out. Our neighbor whose yard backs up to the trees came outside when my husband told him there was something big there last night and the neighbor said oh it won't hurt nothing. I can't help but to think of this creature and the whistling are related. If anyone can help me figure out what it is it would be greatly appreciated. Recently my husband and I traveled to Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge. We had been there a few times and the parallel forest is our favorite place to go, but this time, something weird happened. I wanted to show my husband the stone rock circle we started, so I started walking down by the path I knew to let led to it. Then, for some reason, I found myself walking off the path to a group of trees by themselves. My husband asked where we were going since we were no longer on the path, but I just kept going. I don't know why, it was like something was drawing me in. I was filled with a scene of hopelessness. It wasn't until I was standing in the middle of a creek that I realized I hadn't been in control of myself. I brushed it off and got us back to the right trail, telling my husband I'd just get turned around sometimes. After seeing the stone, we headed back to the car, towards the entrance of the forest, we saw a longhorn cow. We stopped to take pictures, then it started shaking wildly, almost like it was being attacked by a hive of bees. 
I've grown up on farms, but I've never seen a cow move like that. Next thing I know, it started charging us. We ran for it, and the second we exit the trees, the cow just stopped, turning around and walking off. I don't know if I'm just going crazy or not, but that's weird, right? I've heard stories of stuff like that happening in these woods, but never thought they were true. But after all that, I'm really wondering about these boar man stories. Like, could he really be controlling animals and affecting people's thinking? Can't believe I'm asking this about the boar man, but I know one thing. I'm never going back into the parallel forest. I have a few stories. I don't know why things keep happening to me, but I have no reason to lie. I can't tell my stories in normal settings for fear of being branded a nut, but the following actually happened to me and I'd love to hear from anybody who has had similar experiences. I used to work nights in a nightclub in Perth, Western Australia, and on my way home, I had to walk through a large park called Hyde Park. Hyde Park had concrete paths lined with huge Morton Bay fig trees. They are massive trees with large roots, big enough to sit on. One night, I was walking along the path when I noticed the roots of one of the trees were shaped like a person. I thought it was cool when I got close. I knelt down to have a better look. As I bent down, the figure in the tree looked up at me. I think it was a he. I'm not 100% sure though. He was nestled in the roots of the tree and sort of appeared to be a part of it. He was kind of wet looking. At first, I thought he was the victim of a mugging or something and I started to ask if he was alright, but before I could get the words out, I realized he was not human at all. He had a big almond shaped eyes, cat like I think. I guess he looked like pictures of demons of aliens grays to be precise. He had a very, very kind eyes though, and I wish I had stayed to talk, but I was so freaked out that I ran without looking. The next day I went back to look at the tree and there was nothing resembling a person at all. It would be kind of a relief to me if I could write the experience off as a trick of the light or something, but I trust my senses. I saw a few strange things in the park, but that was by far the spookiest. Around January 2001, I was driving around with a friend of mine just chatting and catching up. We decided to call it a night and drove to an area that was close to our flats that I regularly parked. This was a semi-waste ground commonly called the Components Factory thanks to a light industrial area that was now defunct besides the local coach park. Driving alongside the road, we noticed a couple looking and pointing up at us. There was something floating above the building. At first, it literally looked like pieces of black rags that were suspended off the building. There was a noticeable gap between the roof and the rags. We parked the car and I asked my roommate to run back with me to have a closer look at what that thing was. He wasn't having any of it, he said, and w wanted to go home. As peculiar as I found his lack of interest in this was, I understood that he seemed uneased about checking it out and accepted that he wasn't going to come along. I therefore, Ran on my own to the building to see that the couple had moved on and that the thing was no longer on top of the building but floating parallel to the ground at the same height that it had been when I originally saw it. I was able to take a closer look at it and here's when the story somewhat turns weird. What I saw was a floating 8 to 10 meters off the ground, height of the building plus then some. It looked for all intents and purposes like a small and long dog skull where I could make out the snout part in the concave areas where the eyes should have been, in addition to the least small canine fang protrusion coming out of the end of the snout. The rags seemed to be made of genuine fabric, but it looked like a cross between a hood and a matted fur and started halfway into the dog skull and hanged loosely for less than a meter in thick clumps. Whatever it was, I could only describe it as inanimate since it was just floating, hovering is probably a better description, away from the terminal. It made a beeline as the crow flies past a resident block and out the nearby marina where it went out to sea avoiding the long mast of ships in their berths. I had to run around the building to keep up to the marina to see it float away. That was the last I ever saw of that thing and I've never experienced anything remarkable since or before that for that matter. 
The next day, my friend only briefly acknowledged what we saw, whilst driving but never wanted to know more about it. He moved out from Gibraltar to the UK shortly afterwards, not related to the incident, and haven't seen him since. I would certainly appreciate any input on what others think this may have been. I've always been fascinated by tales of cryptic water monsters, though I've never actually seen one myself. But my stepfather's father, an eccentric, yet sharp to the point individual who ordinarily isn't given to making up fanciful tales and whom I'll call Bill, once recalled a time during World War II when he was serving aboard a ship that may have been called into the English Channel. He noticed a commotion one evening on the back deck when he went to investigate. Many crewmen were carrying on. Those who happened to have cameras were eagerly snapping photos, though conveniently Bill didn't have one. What he claims to have saw was something astonishing. A creature was traveling in the water in a perpendicular fashion, just slowly enough to frighten the crewmen into thinking their vessel would collide with this beast. The creature, whose long back broke the water and looked something like a crocodile's, had its head held out of the water as it traveled. Its incredible size was said to be even longer than the vessel itself. Bill stared open-mouthed. As he recounted, the vessel and the creature actually did come very close to colliding, but apparently, the animal had a clear destination in mind. It simply kept on traveling without acknowledging the vessel or looking left or right. Luckily for those on board, and it was not seen to submerge. Crew members followed it with their eyes as long as they were able to until it finally disappeared from sight. This did not sound like a crocodile to me, even a large one. When I pressed Bill for a better description, he stubbornly gathered his bearings and stated, well, it looked like a dinosaur. That's all there is to it, a dinosaur, I swear to it. This was especially chilling to me. My name is Dustin, and I grew up in a town called Cranbrook. It's in southeast British Columbia, in the Kootenays, the middle of nowhere. This story happened about 14 or 15 years ago, 2002 or 2003, with my three other friends, DB, PD, and SR. We were driving around the streets of Cranbrook like any other night. It was around 10 p.m. DB was driving his mom's car. SR was in the back seat behind him. PD was sitting passenger and I was behind him, if my memory is correct. We came to a stop on 2nd Street, crossing Cranbrook Street north to the 10 Book Forestry Building. To our left, waiting to cross the crosswalk, stood a young boy who was wearing what looked like a hospital gown and seemed to be glowing. His gown, his skin, and his hair all illuminated. As the boy began to cross, I recall him appearing to be an old man suddenly, still glowing. Once the figure was directly in front of the car, it was now an old, haggard, aboriginal woman. The gown and glow were gone and she was wearing layers of old tattered clothes. Once she got to the sidewalk, she collapsed, folded right over and fell into the ground. PD rolled down his passenger window and asked if she needed help. Her response was quick and very raspy and shrill. She said, No, I don't. Call the police. No! He must have been in shock, or even just memorized by the incomprehension, because we just went to Safeway, which was open until 11pm, and called 911 on the payphone. By this point, we were in giddy frenzy trying to rationalize what we saw. It spiked our curiosities and imaginations. We were all about 18 and 19 years old then. When we went back to the intersection, the police were already there. The woman had made her way toward the Tembeck building, sitting against the brick wall. The police were approaching her, and she sat in the darkness. We drove off, and that was the last we heard of it, or followed up of it. I often wonder what it could have happened. Uh, if the police called, did they offer help? What if we let her in the car, or even got her to the car for aid? What was it, an alien, a skinwalker, or a figment of collective imaginations? To this day, 
All four of us remember what we saw, and although certain details may differ in our stories, we all agree we witnessed something unexplainable. This happened well over 10 years ago, so I could not provide dates, but my experience happened in Salt Fork, Ohio. I had forgotten about it for years until a silly television show jolted my memory. Now, the more I think on it and write on it, the more details I remember and the more intriguing it becomes to me. I became very excited after reading another member's story that sounded so similar to what I experienced that it sent chills down my spine. This is the post I made after reading a similar account by another member. I am in the opinion that we experienced the same thing. So Swamp, here's my story. The first telling I wrote on here, I had just seen an Animal Planet cryptozoology episode that took place in the same remote area that I had my encounter. When I wrote my reaction in the comment box of the other member's experience, I was more focused on the details that surfaced from my memory than the first time I was told about that happened. So here is the second that I recall. It was late. We were sitting around the campfire, eating hot dogs and cleaning our rifles from a day's volley of rounds. When out of nowhere, this horrible, ear-piercing, aggressive scream came from the tree line, no more than 20 yards away. This thing was so loud that I could feel the vibrations of the sound waves go through my chest. It was just like being at a metal concert and being too close to the speakers. Whatever this thing was, it was angry, and it seemed directed at us. I am sure you are familiar with wildlife indigenous to your area, as in you know the sounds they can make. I am also a veteran camper and I know all of the sounds of the night brings from coyotes, owls, foxes, etc. Let me just say, this is like nothing I have ever heard, period. This was no coyote, fox, bear, or owl, falcon, or etc. The three of us jolted up and instinctively ported our rifles in the direction of the awful noise. I wanted to pull the trigger right then, but I was afraid things would go from bad to worse. My buddy Brian, voice shaking, goes, I I'm going back to the car. We started slowly walking towards the car. I still had my Remington aimed steady at the group of trees, ready to fire. As I got a bit further away, I thought that maybe it would not follow us if we let off a shot or two. So I did. I fired two rounds into the dark woods. And just based on intuition alone, I think whatever made the sound was long gone. We made it to the car and sat inside clutching rifles until daybreak. When we got back to the campsite, everything was how we left it. Nothing was missing or damaged. The three of us have never been so scared and we haven't spoken since of the incident. So this happened a couple of years ago. I was walking home from my work and my road is a busy road so it's busy with people and cars and it was rush hour. Walking towards me from a distance was somebody wearing a black hoodie with the hood up. I noticed that something seemed to be wrong with their face. I didn't want to look at them too much and avoid being rude but I couldn't help but noticing that they were walking in a hurried way and as if they did not want to be seen keeping their head down. As I got closer to them, I couldn't resist getting a closer look. So I looked over to their face and it was almost completely blank. Like when you're editing a photo and you turn the brightness or contrast all the way up so all the facial features are gone apart from the eyes, mouth, and nose. This is what this person's face was, but instead of pure white, more the yellowy white of the moon or magnolia paint. That's not all. When I looked at their face, religious images flooded in my mind of horror, evil, and hell. That was a total fist for me. I'm not a religious person at all. My mind got very bad vibes from what I had just seen, and something told me that I should forget about what I'd seen and not think about it again. Very unusual for me. I'm not usually a curious person, but I felt compelled to forget about this ASAP. So I actually made an effort to not think about it and didn't tell anyone about it until several weeks later when the emotions I felt were more faded. 
I don't think they just had a deformity or skin condition because there was nothing there rather than something. And the emotions and images I got from looking at their face were unlike anything I've ever experienced. I wish I hadn't tried to forget it so instantly, as I might remember other things about it that could point to a more logical explanation or something else, whatever it may be. Several years ago, I lived in a basement suite with my two kids. There was a lot of paranormal activity in the two years that we lived there. We ended up moving out due to guys upstairs partying and doing crack, so that could have contributed to stuff going on downstairs. The first week that I moved in, my kids were at their dad's house. I was alone in the living room, in total silence, reading something on my laptop. I had an upholstered chair sitting a few feet from me. I heard something that sounded like a very heavy object, like a book, hitting the seat of the chair. Although, really, the seat was soft enough that anything heavy hitting it would not have made much sound at all. But that was where the sound was coming from. I glanced up, and when I did, I saw this thing on the chair. It kind of looked like a little ferret sandy or caramel colored. When it saw me look over, it tried to duck behind the arm of the chair. Then it just disappeared. It was there one second and gone the next. It surprised me, but it didn't frighten me. It was just weird. I can't even say that it looked like a ferret. That is just the only thing that I could compare it to. About a year later, my youngest son and I were in a bedroom, on my bed, playing this game we called the baby game. Basically, just one of us pretended to be a baby while the other person was the parent. Sometimes the baby was a bad baby, sometimes good. I think that my youngest son was just wanting some nurturing after a bad breakup between his parents. My son was being the baby and I was lying beside him, stroking him and talking to him. It was early evening and my bedside lamp was on. My bed was a box spring and a mattress with out legs so it was kind of close to the ground. I was looking over at my son and right beside the bedside table was this thing again. It was only there for a second and then disappeared, fast enough that I didn't trust my eyes. It was two or three feet high toddler size and was standing right against the bed like an inch away from my son. It was covered in long, slightly curly caramel colored hair but it had no face, arms or shoulders that I could see. It looked like a cousin, it from the Adams family. It didn't have the shape of a dog, it was straight up and down. As I said it was split second so I didn't see any movement. I didn't feel any energy from it negative or otherwise, it was neutral. I was really surprised to see it. I didn't see anything to my son because I honestly believed that it was some weird sight issue. A few minutes later it was my turn to be the baby. My son was looking over at me and I was close to the edge of the bed. He blinked for a second and said, Mom, I just saw this weird thing. I think it was a wig creature or a ghost dog. He described the exact same thing, color and shape, and he said he only saw it for a second. He had been claiming throughout the time we lived there that he saw giant bulldog faces in the middle of their room. I thought that he was making it up because he had a bulldog stuffy that he really liked. We also saw a lot of ghosts there in that place. Pretty much if you turn off the lights you could see a whole bunch of people standing in the dark. In the front was an old lady and the back was a little Asian girl. I had a very elaborate way of turning on my lights at night that involved me never looking in the dark and in bed I never opened my eyes. Some of my internet friends make jokes at my expense because I live in Arkansas. Do you even have electricity and do you find your cousin attractive? What we do have is a fuckload of trees and mountains. You leave the greater Little Rock area and drive through 30 minutes and hit a town. Another 30 minutes and you hit another town. Another 30 and you see where this is going. You know the saying that the universe is 99% empty space? That's basically this fucking state, but it's 99% woods. I lived on the edge of one such huge expanse of woods. I spent a lot of time in the woods with my friends. We'd find normal dead animal carcasses, weird fire circles set up by local rednecks or meth heads and other basic inner wood stuff. So one night I was going through some normal teenage angst shit and I was sitting on the roof, looking at the stars. 
It's mostly full moon, and I can see through the trees, and it's really chill up there. It was a nice autumn breeze. My mom and little sister were sitting outside on the hot tub right under the edge of the roof in front of me. I hear them get up to go in, and I'm still relaxing. You know the feeling where you know something is watching you? It's different from the regular spooky vibe you'll get. It's something in your brain that doesn't care about the reason or reality TV. He's the hit or woman over the head and get it. All of a sudden my relaxation is gone. I immediately know something is not okay. I know something is staring at me and it would like nothing better than to eat my scrawny ass. Just for reference, there's an edge of the roof, just about 6 feet of deck, and then 20 feet of yard until our 6 foot privacy fence. We set up the privacy fence in front of this shitty chain link fence that was there before we moved in because, you know, meth heads. And then behind the fence is a ton of shitty bushes and shrubs, and then right behind that is trees. I start to scan the fence and I notice something directly in front of where I was going. Keep in mind, my mom and little sister would have been between me and it. So I notice this outline. All I know is I see black of the shrubs and trees, and then right above the privacy fence is what looks like brown colored outline of a head and shoulders. My first thought was, the fuck, is someone standing on the chain lens vent looking over? The thing rattles like a motherfucker when I climb on it, so it can't be that. Apparently my feet had gotten under and started moving my ass towards the edge of the roof without consulting my brain. I get to the edge of the roof and looking at the sat line when I hear a scream from a horror movie monster. Imagine if you shoved a bear, a cougar, and one of those screech owls into a mosh pit and recorded the noises, then added some heavy distortion to it. I remember instantly turning and running to the opposite side of the roof, parkoured off that bitch and ran inside, crying to my mom. When I was little, I was often terrorized by these three things. I suppose entity is really the only proper term. I'll start by saying that these three entities were not at all similar in appearance to anything I feared in childhood. On the contrary, one of them was quite like an animal. I always thought I had an undeserving and bad reputation. The experiences were not like dreams, but they weren't sleep paralysis either. I was free to move around as I pleased and had no reason to believe that carbon monoxide was the culprit. The first entity was like an alligator however. It had a frightfully expressive face. Not human level expression but like a dog you consider part of the family. But instead of loyalty and love, the creature's face was full of menace and arrogance. It would crawl around the floor and snap at me. But I was under the impression that it could not, for the time being, actually harm me if I stayed off the ground. The second was less lively, but much, much scarier. Fortunately, it resided in my grandma's home. It was kind of an angular shadow with bright lights for eyes. It moved around room to room, but only when no one was present but me. Looking at it filled me with dread and terror, but when I closed my eyes, felt that it could do nothing to me. I spent a lot of time walking around the house with my eyes shut. The third was the least outwardly scary, but the strangest. It usually accompanied the alligator, but would occasionally be found alone in my bathroom. It was large, purple blob without any features. There was no doubt that it was alive, but it was not lively in the least. It was almost the embodiment of looming anxiety and, unlike the former, would shrink into nothingness if I looked at it long enough. But, when the alligator was around, looking at the purple thing was hard to do. One night, I awoke to see the alligator feverishly crawling around, snapping and snarling at me. It seemed almost pained. Strangely enough, I felt no fear this time. I looked over to the big, comfy chair next to my bed and saw it was being accompanied by a smallish, grandfatherly man. He was staring at the alligator. Without looking up, he told me, go back to sleep. I won't leave until they can't come back. So I did just that. When I woke up, the man and alligator were gone. None of them ever came back. Although I have felt a presence like the old man's a few times in life. We were in the Dominican Republic, staying at a locally owned hotel. 
It was a nice hotel, but nothing luxe, and very open soft airspace. We had all gone out for dinner and enjoyed a bottle of wine, but weren't drunk or anything. I'm reading in bed and my husband comes out from the bathroom completely white-faced in shock. Um, there's a spider in the bathroom. I look at him and laugh. Spiders in the Dominican Republic are big, but nothing to freak over. He looked like as of Satan himself, by his expression. So I go to the bathroom. All I see are four thick, hairy, orange and black legs coming from the sink basin. They were at least ten inches long and at least as thick as pencils. Very hairy. From about five feet away, I could see separate orange-black hairs. I'm short, so I couldn't see the whole thing over the sink from the distance I was. There was a towel blocking the direct view plus the sink basin. But just by the legs, I saw that it was almost a two-foot-long spider. I calmly walked back to my husband. Did you see it? I nod and leave the room to get help from the front desk. Our broken Spanish had the staffers in hysterical laughter, not to mention that they had just took as overactive tourists of scared of a little spider. One staffer, Jose, came to look and it was gone. Jose tells us that he has at least three in his home, which is when I realize that these people don't either believe me or understand what I'm saying. I've lived in tropical climes before and there's no way in hell you'd share a home with a spider we saw. A day later, and we have a normal spider infestation. I go to the desk and ask for bug spray. The staffers are still having a laugh at our expense, but the same guy Jose comes up with me with the spray. We are cleaning the spiders, and we are about 5 inches or so of daddy long leg types. He is surprised when I am suddenly not scared by these spiders. He asks why I informed him that these spiders aren't what we saw last night. I use my hands to show him the size of the one we saw. His mouth dropped. I have never heard or seen anything like that in my entire life in the Dominican Republic but who knows what comes out of the jungle. It wasn't until a little while later that my husband, while discussing with Harry, our pet name for this spider, realized that we had only seen half of it. My estimate of a 10 inch leg would probably actually be about 20. Two feet was severely off. He saw the whole body, and the body minus the legs. It was as wide as his entire hand, a grown man's hand so it was likely way bigger than two feet in diameter. He also said there were multiple black eyes. While fishing on the Stiligwamish River near Robe, Washington on September 5th of 1980, I came across a set of three large human-like tracks in the river sand. Two of these tracks were spaced side by side facing the river edge, while the third track was five feet away behind the others, behind a boulder. A hillside sloping away from the river revealed slide marks which appeared to be made by the culprit as it made its way to the river and apparently walked into the water. A search in subsequent days of both sides of the river found no more tracks in the area. Rene Dahiden arrived at the scene one week later and the tracks could still be seen, indicating a very little human trafficking area. Newspaper articles about this find turned up more that 10 additional people from the area who claimed to have had or found similar tracks nearby in recent years, and one claimed to have seen the Sasquatch who made them. This area of Washington State has a history of Sasquatch sightings and footprint finds, and some good audio tapes have been recorded in Snohomish County of supposed Sasquatch vocalizations. Although these footprints do not prove the existence of a Sasquatch, the large amount of reported activity in the area by credible witnesses indicates that something strange is going on there. Dr. Jeff Meldrum at Idaho State University has the only surviving cast from this occurrence and concluded that it follows the pattern of other authentic casts in his collection. Around 15 years ago, me and a friend of mine were horseback riding along the FEC railroad tracks between SR-207 and Kings Estate Road. We were heading south towards Kings Estate Road when we noticed a smell like something was dead. I thought maybe it was a hog or something that died in the woods. We heard branches breaking and something was in the woods. 
but didn't pay much attention to it. Then, the horses started to act up. The horses were blowing and snorting and rearing, and I just thought that they were being bad and difficult. As we passed that area, the horses acted better, and we went on down the side of the track, still heading south. When I heard the sound of rocks on the side of the tracks, like something was walking up onto them. I told my friend I was with, don't walk the horse on the rocks, and she said, I'm not. Just then, I turned to look around. She was just behind me to see what it was. That's when we saw it. It was about 150 yards away from where we were, just standing in the middle of the railroad tracks. It was in sort of a crouched position, but not all the way down, like it just saw us and froze and stared at us. What I saw was a slim and covered in reddish brown hair, it had long arms, and I could see the eyes a little. It was six and a half feet tall and around 250 pounds or better, with no neck. It was getting dark out so we couldn't see any detail on the face. All the time that we saw it, it had to fight with the horses to keep them under control. They didn't want any part of whatever it was, and neither did we. So we got out of there, and I never went back riding there again. It wasn't a bear, and it wasn't a man, unless he was covered in hair from head to toe. On August 5th, 2001, on U.S. Highway 287, which is 31 miles west of Palestine, Texas, I was traveling westbound at 65 miles per hour when I saw what looked like a bear cub or a very large dog sitting in the middle of the road. I slowed down to 15 miles per hour. I hit my high beams and stopped about 20 yards away from the animal. I put on my four-way flashers, turned on my interior spotlight. As I looked up, I saw a huge bipedal creature that I will call Bigfoot. It walked from the soft shoulder of the road to the animal in the road. As he, I am pretty sure it was a male, walked in front of my tractor, he shielded his eyes, not seemingly out of shyness, but more as an effort to protect his eyes from the bright lights. I reduced my headlights to a low beam, but decided not to turn them off as I was in the middle of the highway. I was doing my best to protect them by blocking the road with my tractor trailer. The big male went over to what I realized was a toddler. He grabbed its shoulder and attempted to grab the little one's arm. The little one scooted away like a child trying to get away from a parent that wants the child to go somewhere and the child doesn't want to go. The little one had greater agility than the big male. The little one squirmed, scrambled, and scooted further up the road where they were. Then, something caught my eye and ear directly next to my driver's window. I casually looked over, and within two feet of my face was a female. No doubt female. She had nursing breasts and extended nipples. Her eyes were almost even with my eye level. I measured it from where the top of her head came up to my mirror. It was seven foot, four inches tall. The male was at least one foot taller than her, plus some. She had a gamey smile, but it didn't stink. Immediately upon seeing her, I smiled with all the teeth I have. From the interior spotlight, which was pointed down toward my lap, I am sure she was able to see me clearly. I certainly saw her clearly. So clearly, I could smell her and feel her breath. I particularly noticed the volume of air that she breathed. Not out of breath or even heavy breathing just a large volume of air with each breath. I again smiled at her and asked, Is the baby okay? She slowly smiled back at me. I noticed a dental anomaly. Either she had a double row of teeth, or the crowns of her teeth were split on the top center to give the impression of two rows of teeth. She then reached into the tractor and stroked my beard, like I do when I'm thinking. My beard is mid-chest length and multicolored. It was then I realized the large male's head was identical to mine, although his beard was shorter. The female had thin facial hair on her chin. The rest of his fur was dark brown with traces of gray and white on his shoulders, back and chest. She was a mixture of brown and reddish fur, mostly reddish brown. As she took her hand off my beard and took her hand out of my tractor, I extended my hand out to her. She sandwiched my hand between her two hands, and her two hands were 
easily two to three times bigger than mine. Her hands felt like roughneck work gloves or rough leather. At this point, she gave me a soulful look. From her facial expressions and her watery eyes, I took what she was saying. Thank you for not running over my baby. The eyes were not dead eyes. They were bright and moist, just very dark brown, but not black. The large male had the child under his arm, like a sack of potatoes. He never looked directly at me as I watched him walk back into the tree line. I noticed at least three more, I suspected even more, at the tree line. They ranged from the height of a female to slightly shorter, but none came close to the size of the male. During the summer of 93, I owned five acres in the Cascade Mountains of Southwest Washington in Skamania County. The area is rather remote, with very few people living up there. Most are one-fourth mile at the closest to neighbors. I was outside in the yard around dusk playing with my daughter and my gray wolf dog, when the neighbor's dogs, who lived farther up the canyon that used to hunt deer, started to make more noise than usual. As I listened to them, there was this very loud growling slash howling sound that was unlike anything I've ever heard. It made the hairs on my dog's neck stand up, and mine too. All at once, the canyon was dead silent, which is very unusual being in a canyon. Even the most slightest noises seemed to echo down the canyon, and on the air there was always this horrible smell that I would relate to something dead mixed in with a very musky smell. As I told my daughter to get in the house, I noticed that my dog was cowering under the house and refused to come out when I tried to call him in the house. Living in the mountains is such a remote place. It is not unusual to see or hear mountain lions, black bears, pumas, elks, and the like. And I am familiar with the sounds of these animals. My dog has chased without fear, or sense I should say, all of the animals above and he has never cowered, even when he is charged by a bull elk during the rutting season until that evening. That was the quietest night I have ever experienced there. Not the unusual dogs barking in the distance, but dead quiet. The only noise I heard was the occasional crashing and breaking of wood, like something big was out in the woods. I'm not saying what it was because I didn't see it, but to this day, in my mind, I know what it was. This memory will be with me for the rest of my life. I grew up in one of those tiny towns around Texas Hill Country and Bandera County. As a kid back in the late 70s, I used to play with a neighbor lady's grandson, who would come down every summer from Baltimore, Maryland, to stay with her for two weeks. He was a real big city boy. Everybody pretty much has a rural resident area where all residents connect quickly with the woods. One afternoon, I went to visit the neighbor boy who was there visiting. He was a bit spoiled and was allowed to stay up till 4 or 5 a.m. Every night, watching TV, and then sleep till early afternoon the next day. But this day, he was freaked out because he told me that the night before at around 3 a.m., he had happened to look out his window and saw a huge man thing walk very briskly down another neighbor's long gravel driveway and disappear into the darkness and woods behind their house. This neighbor, had a streetlight on their carport that lit the whole area at night where he saw the thing. His view was unobstructed and about 75 yards away. He said that the thing covered 50 or 60 yards within a few seconds. When I first began to believe him was when we were dirt biking a day or two later down a long, desolate county road, unpaved on my dirt bike. He kept asking me, he was on the back of my dirt bike, when we were going to turn around. We got to the end of the road and I killed the bike and pretended it wouldn't start. This poor kid was screaming at the brush and scanning it like he was scared to death. Something would come out and get us. He was panicking and crying and saying that we had to get out of there because we have these things roaming around. Seeing him so freaked out got me a little freaked out too and we left. We were both about 11 or 12 at the time. I now live in San Antonio. Last winter, 
Our 10 o'clock news had a brief blurb about two men witnessing either one or two Sasquatch chasing deer off Highway 51, which is a little connector road that runs between the northwest outskirts of town. This subject is fascinating. I learned after reading a lot of stories that they don't just dwell in tall forests. There are a lot of sightings in Low Brush County. I wish I had a lot more info about the deer chasing incident. A few weeks after a camping trip I took, I was at home on Norrell Street in Channelview, Texas, east of Houston, just north of I-10. We had a house that was L-shaped with a small storage room on the north side. Between the storage room and the inside corner of the L was a concrete patio, and next to the storeroom was the sliding back door that went into the den slash family room. It was about 9 or 10 p.m., and I was getting ready to go to bed. I was in the bathroom that was next to the inside corner of the L, and it had a window that looked out onto the patio at the back of the house. The light was on next to the back door, so you could see everything that was on the patio up to the side of the storeroom. As I finished my shower and was drying off, I could see the full shape of someone standing at the back sliding door, looking into the den, where my dad was sitting. My dad was in the lounge chair with his back to the door watching the television that was on the opposite wall. Although the bathroom window had water on it from the steam, I could see that this thing was looking and was bent forward in order to have his head low enough to be able to see in the house. This was a big person, both in height and bulk, and that was when I decided to wipe the window with my towel. I should have turned the light off in the bathroom first, but I didn't, and just as I started to wipe the window, it stood up. It looked at me, turned and with one step was off the patio and around the storage room before I could get a good look at it. If I remember right, the size of the patio was 6 foot by 12, so it would have taken at least a few feet to get off there. It had to take one step that covered about 5 feet to get off the patio. Anyway, I covered myself with a towel and went into the den when my dad was thinking he may have fallen asleep with the TV, like he usually did, but he was awake in his chair and I told him what I saw. He looked at me and said, yeah, I know. I can see the shadow from the back door, on the floor in the den. I flew up to Spokane on 13th of April 2012 to visit my brother and do some turkey hunting. After we set up camp, everyone wanted to go do some counting. Season opened up on Sunday, so we went off. I'm not new to hunting or hiking, but I am new to doing it in the mountains. Did I mention I'm from the Dallas area? It's flat and not that far above sea level. This was tough on me. We hiked what seemed like miles to me, but was actually maybe a half of a mile to a small opening in the forest. As everyone was looking for signs and I was looking for a breath, someone spotted a portable hunting blind, the kind that pops up. Anyway, we went and checked it out. We found deer bait. The blind was falling in, but inside there was a day pack, skinning knife, and a pair of Oakley sunglasses. The young man with us pointed out that these weren't cheap. None of us could figure out why anyone would leave such items behind unless they left in a hurry. Maybe two or three days later, my brother borrowed his friend's quad and I followed him on this area to a few miles away where they had some luck in the past. I parked the quad and walked up a small field. These fields, as it turned out, are home homesteads long gone. Anyway, I set up and started calling after an hour and a half or so, and not hearing anything, I decided to head back. It was getting late, and I still thought I'd ride up the forest service to the top. As I got closer to the top, I noticed it looked somewhat open, and the rocks looked like a fortress. When I reached the top, the forest service road had installed these Kelly bumps to keep ATVs out. As I turned around, I noticed the climb would not be too bad, maybe 10 or 15 yards not real steep. I parked at the bottom of the switchback, set the brake and turned off the quad. As I swung my leg over, that's when I heard a very clear and very close knock or should I say hit. It sounded like my helmet was full blasting music, but it wasn't. It was such a loud sound. I scanned the top, which is where the knocks came from. I still have trouble telling about this what I felt. I knew I should have left, but 
I was just interested. As I drove down the many small switchbacks, I was looking everywhere. I knew I was being watched. I was hoping I was not being chased. It took a while to tell the guys what had happened. I'm sure there are lots of folks up there who camp and hike and have never hear or see anything strange, but I've been going up there with my brother for the past four or five years and this was a first for me. The story started flowing in after I mentioned it. It rained the next day so my brother and I doubled up on the quad and went back to the same spot, only this time there were no sounds whatsoever. We parked and walked across the Kelly bumps and down the other side. He's looking for turkey sign and I'm looking everywhere else. We came to an opening with a blind in it. We traveled about a half a mile. I hunted the next opening and my brother went back to the quad. I made my way back to the camp and never realized how close an area this all was. One of the other guys went to the train after, dark, when he came out to our tent and wanted to know if we were trying to scare him with the growls and huffing sounds. That was not off. That's definitely off limits. He blew it off as a bear, but I'm not so sure. If interested, my brother could give exact location not to mention another report that happened to him and his son this past elk season. Forget about the wild man of Borneo. Back in the early 1900s, we had our own wild man right here in Wood County, Wisconsin. In August of 1910, the local papers were full of stories of encounters with the Wood County wild man. Marshfield Stevens Point, Oshkosh, and Grand Rapids newspapers all had stories with various details about the strange man near Auburndale. It was first reported that Marshfield was in terror over the wild man who was living in the forest surrounding Auburndale on August 15th. It said he occasionally appeared in the open, wearing only a shirt, more abbreviated than a Scottish kilt. Reporters were quick to point out the man had been seen in broad daylight and the story was neither a hoax nor hallucination. Though, to inhabit a wooded spot near the old George Zollinger place, the unkept man was called wild as a hawk in his actions. The Eckwelds, who resided there, had seen him many times, but any attempt to approach him, he made off his lair with the speed of a deer. He puts one hand on a fence post and vaults five wire fence as easily as a college athlete and his speed defies pursuit, according to one story. A group of men and boys had tried to surround and approach him, but he leaped a fence and went into the ground in deep thickets. Local berry pickers were given this domain, a wide berth as authorities tried to capture him. Officer Smith and Thompson from Marshfield and Sheriff Griffin to Grand Rapids had been searching but had only managed to elude them, never allowing them a glimpse. A subsequent story joked that they were especially anxious to catch him so he could be the star attraction of the street fair of the following week. The wild man became such a hot topic that Griffin and Schmidt actually perpetuated a joke on a salon keeper with the aid of a curly babcock who impersonated the wild man in realistic style, giving rise to the story that had been apprehended. Another time, Officer Thompson and D.A. Andrews made fruitless trip to the area where he was often seen. Unlike Griffin and Schmidt though, they extended sympathy toward the man, stating it was likely the new man was deranged, but since no one had uh, reported anything missing, it was different and difficult to say that the man was or where he came from. Meanwhile, in Plover, 21-year-old William N.S., who was living in the woods of Plover, milking cows and stealing food in the nighttime, was captured, examined, and found insane and committed to the Northern Asylum. Likewise, in the woods of Colby, wild man Herman Schneider, who was living on a game in Roots, eventually was captured and hospitalized. In Wood County, however, no reports were ever made of the wild man's capture. Who was he? And what was his story? Who knows? But perhaps the wood legend is true. And maybe it does have its very own Bigfoot. A throwback to this early wild man. The Lummi Indian Reservation is in the inland northwest corner of Washington, 8 miles west of Bellingham and 20 miles south of the Canadian border in western Whatcom County. After receiving several reports of Sasquatch sighting on the Lummi Nation Indian Reservation, Lummi Police Sergeant Ken Cooper 
was called to the residence of 78-year-old Emma Smith on the night of October 23 of 1975. She reported a Bigfoot attempt to break into her house, and she had fled in terror. Sergeant Cooper found the plastic of the storm door had been torn, and the door's wooden frame splintered. Boards had also been torn from a nearby smokehouse, but he could not find the creature nor any person. He returned to the residence around 2.30 a.m., shining the spotlight from his patrol car into the woods. He found a group of seven people already there, with their own spotlight set directly on a huge, seven and a half foot tall, hairy creature. Cooper aimed his 12 gauge shotgun at the creature. Concerned that it would be a human in a costume, he yelled, If there's somebody just fooling around, you better knock it off because we have weapons. The creature just crouched down. As Sergeant Cooper stepped forward, the creature lowered himself down even further until only his head was showing above the brush. For 20 minutes, Sergeant Cooper and the other people stared down the crouching hairy creature until they heard noises in the brush to the right and people said that they were seeing more Bigfoots there. At that point, Cooper decided it was time for them to leave the scene. He returned to the location after dawn and found bare footprints in the forest covered ground. He measured the footprints and they were 18 inches long and 7 inches wide. Over the coming weeks, the Lummi Tribal Police received over 100 reports of sightings of Bigfoot creatures. Sergeant Cooper himself saw Bigfoots two more times shortly after the first encounter. A veteran hunter from Maple Falls, Washington named Such was scout hunting areas while south of the Canadian border on the U.S. side due west of NF-3140, but somewhere east of the South Pass Road. Stopping to rest, he was sitting up against a tree off of a well-worn game trail, waiting and resting. He was sitting in complete camouflage gear, listening to something walking up from behind. He said he sat frozen because it was too leg sounding. He could hear it breathe. His heart was pounding in his chest for more time than he said he cared to admit, because he was there and there was no trail behind him. Such never did see whatever made the crashing footsteps in the brush behind him. Finally, another hunter walked up on the game trail in front of him, and as the man walked past him with his pack and rifle, Such hollered out, Hello, scaring the other hunter nearly to death. Such realized he scared the fellow hunter because he jumped sideways and asked him if he wanted to sit down with him, welcoming the company of another hunter who said he was from Nooksack, Washington area. The Nooksack man sat down and of course the conversation told Such that he had encountered something that he had never seen before in those woods, which is why he was so nervous. He had tracked this something up near where Such had been sitting around and Such figured that that was why he was heard passing behind him earlier moments before. The Nooksack man never did say what he thought he saw, only that it was covered with hair like a bear and maybe eight to nine feet tall huge and walking on two legs like a man walks. He said it was no bear, of that I am sure. From the description, Such thought it was a Sasquatch and he told the Nooksack man what he thought the man had saw and then he went quiet. He got up and left and went back down the game trail. He never get this man to see or ever meet him again. The informants. A man and his wife were not too far from me camping in the summer of 2000, and during their stay they were experiencing some rather frightful events. The reason they contacted me was because they had come across a sighting, and because theirs happened so close to where mine was, they wanted to talk to me. They were camping for two weeks, and during this time their food was being taken, and even some clothes were missing. They thought maybe coyotes or even bears, but one morning, after hearing something in the campsite during the night, they woke up to find everything else tossed around the campsite. Even the guy's boat on the trailer was moved a few feet. One night in particular, something hit the side of the window and broke it, and in the morning they found a large rock sitting there in the dirt. On another night, they said it sounded like a few people were on outside their trailer, mumbling. Jill said it was like someone had their mouth full of food. I pictured the picture of a Sasquatch eating all their food and trying to talk to each other. 
After that morning, they cleaned up and had breakfast when Jill had noticed bare footprints just off the side of their camper, and they said it was obvious to them by the size of the prints that their visitor during the night had to be a Sasquatch, nothing else. They said that the prints were around 18 inches long. The man put his size 12 foot inside the print, and there were still 5 or so inches more than in his in length. They told me that a couple days later, they were out in the boat fishing and actually saw this thing in their campsite while they were out on the boat. Apparently, it was throwing their stuff around and making a mess of things. The couple described the Sasquatch as a reddish brown with long arms and a funny shaped head. They believed it to be a male because of its bulk size and height which they said was about 7 to 8 feet tall. I asked if it could have been a bear and they both replied, as God is our witness, what we saw was a Sasquatch. After describing the arms, legs, and head and all, there was nothing else it could have been. Personally, judging by their body language and the way they were trembling while talking to me, I believe them 100%, no doubt whatsoever. The older couple said they waited in their boat for a while until they were certain it was gone, and as fast as they could they chucked everything into their camper and left the area, only packing up properly when they got to town where they ended up staying in the night. My name is X. I am an eight-year veteran of the U.S. Army with a clearance to lose, so please keep my name out. Sometime in 2001, my now ex-wife and I were driving towards Scranton, Pennsylvania on Highway 81. It was late at night. My wife and I were talking to help break the monotony. I had just noticed a very dark object leaning over the edge of the road as we drove past. We passed extremely close to the object close enough for me to feel the shock to see a very large, hairy section of wall, muscled leg, and big hairy wrist, and a hand as the creature turned and strode to walk the embankment as we passed. The area we were driving through was through a mountainous area of the Pennsylvania section. The incline he had been had to have gone down several hundred feet at a sharp angle. My wife screamed and grabbed me. I slammed on the brakes and reached for my 20 gauge mag shotgun. My wife screamed again and hysterically told me no way in hell was I getting out of the car. I tried my best to tell her, hey, I'm combat trained, I have a weapon, I just have to see what the hell it was, but she would have none of it and kept freaking out. In disgust, I drove off mad at the world for letting me get a tiny glimpse of one of the world's greatest mysteries. What a tease the whole thing was. I wanted to see the entire thing for myself, but what can I say? It looked like a linebacker with a serious hair issue. I would estimate it would have been at least seven to eight feet tall. What really surprised me was the attitude of the thing. No fear of our vehicle at all. My wife and I have both seen bear before and agreed it was not a bear. What bear can walk down an incline on its hind legs? I spent the rest of the trip starting out the window, wishing I had seen more of whatever it was. <laughs> 